obviously I've been a deep admirer of your of your playing for a long time. The mm -hmm. uh, first time I saw you was when I was nine years or ten years old when I saw uh, Schofield's Quiet Band in Dortmund in Germany. Uh, my, my father took me to the concert and I was, you know, I was listening to Schofield before then, but that was the first time I saw him live. And then it was with you playing those beautiful arrangements on the... Yeah, yeah, beautiful songs. On the keyboard you played the, you know... The horn was, part. Right? Yeah, and I only heard one bootleg i only have one bootleg of that band <laughs> and i love it to death because it it uh, brings me back to that experience of seeing mm. you guys mm. and where i obviously is a long time ago i only remember certain you know flashes in a way like seeing yeah. the, just, just seeing him there or the, how you yeah. guys set up or whatever and a feel the feeling i got from that now that i have you in front of me i'd, I'd like to talk to you about the experience uh, of working with schofield yeah, how you went about it after you heard the, the the quiet record, and then you were giving the task to you. Okay, now it's your job to do the the horn part in a way. Yeah. And how did it feel to play with with, with Sko and? You know? I mean, I was roommates with Bill Stewart back in the early '90s. You know, we were working together, and so he was playing with Sko back then, in the early '90s, and uh, you know that band with Larry and Seamus. That was Seamus put. Even though we were all kind of playing together anyway, he put a record together of his own called The Call. Right, um, yeah. And that was that band, So and it had Kurt, so Kurt was in place of Schofield, I guess. Yeah. I don't know whether Sko heard that record or what, but he. But we were all playing together anyway, and I guess um, Sko maybe called me and asked about doing some playing, and with, so he put together a session. And, you know, I guess it was kind of obvious that we were being auditioned in a way, you know, mm -hmm. or at least he probably just, you know, feeling how the band, how we work together and how it felt. But yeah, I mean, I, I heard that record and, you know, he asked me to do some of the horn stuff on the keyboard and it was early days of keyboard stuff in a way for sampling things, uh, at least what I had access to at the time. And, you know, I had a Korg that had a decent French horn sound, uh, I guess. And, uh, and and just you know he must have given me the parts or whatever and i i learned them mm -hmm. but in terms of just working with sco i mean it was just a real treat he's such an incredible improviser and great sound and time i mean you know you've done some stuff with him yourself mm -hmm. and he's he was a real you know a real hero and uh, just great music great melodies and yeah a real gift to get to play with him how was he in terms of producing uh, like, uh, was he very hands-on uh, in your oh, recording? Oh, yeah, no, so long ago. I mean, but I, yeah, he was great. Uh, just, just having his presence there, and I mean, he would hear things. Hey, man, try that. In fact, I remember it was seventh. That record, seventh sense, and it was with Seamus. Yeah. And Doug Weiss and and Brian Blade and. I love that record, man. Thanks, man. Beautiful. Yeah, I was really excited, and Steve Nelson. Oh and, yeah, uh, sure, yeah. And I was just really excited to be. It was an exciting time. It was my first record for Blue Note. And I remember that song, Seven Cents, when we did this kind of, I think it was, we were just fooling around doing that kind of space out stuff. We're just playing in seven as the song was and and uh, making all kind of weird sounds. And Seamus was doing weird harmonics and stuff. And Brian was playing on the rims mm -hmm. a bit. And it had a cool texture. And, and I remember us go saying, man, you should do that, you know. Mm. that uh, do that as the outro you know for the great so like having someone with those ears you know and just that experience too you know obviously years decades of experience at that point um was really cool and uh you know but other but that it was kind of hands off i had my tunes and i pretty i had a pretty clear vision of how i wanted things to go mm. but again to have someone like that there to bounce stuff off of and and I guess, you know, he would have, I don't know if he had heard Seamus before that, but he had a chance there. I can certainly check mm. him out. Yeah. A friend of mine, um, he had a, a lesson with you at some point. And he told me that you talked about the concept um, that a teacher called Dorothy Taubman introduced to you. He, well, yeah, my teacher was, it came from Dorothy, but who was the originator of the technique. I see. Or at least... You know, every nothing comes from nowhere. But she yeah. had other people that she uh, she got things from. But 
she put it together and uh yeah, that was uh my teacher's name was Eleanor Hancock and I studied yeah. with her in New York. And uh she was my teacher from uh sort of uh as being a, a junior in high school for several years after that through college. And uh she um I met her through Bill Charlap. Mm -hmm. Um and Bill and I were studying with the same teacher um at the time, a man by the name of Jack Riley, who recently passed. Um, and we were studying a certain kind of, I guess it was maybe coming from the sort of Russian tradition of the piano, and which, if there is any one tradition there, this one was about curled, very curled fingers and, and focusing more on finger strength and finger development that way. And um, that never quite felt right to me um, but, you know, I gave it a shot and so did, so did Bill, but, but he started having problems with that. And then, so he switched over to this more open hand, more of a natural hand way of playing and, but a certain way of traversing the keys that involved, um, the very small, uh, mov movements that involved the forearm and yeah. walking from one finger to the next in a natural hand position. So... So it wasn't straining and pulling and uh, that kind of thing. And, and also focused certain things on tone production and how, how, to, how to get a kind of a warm tone and, and, in, a, and in a way that was, uh, you know, the, the technique, I guess, kind of grew out of this woman trying to figure out why certain pianists were getting injured and others weren't in the class, yeah. you know, classical music and practicing whatever. But, um, you know, what, are, what is someone doing uh, obviously correctly, you know, assuming that's what it is, if they're not getting injured and what's, you know, what are the mechanics of that? And uh, she found that um, correct uh, use of the body and, and gra using gravity more than muscle. Yeah. And, and muscle and the, the, yeah, the weight of the, the arm in, in a way that was, uh, you know, not dead weight, obviously, but a way that you would harness. Yeah you know, centripetal force and these kinds of things. And you could kind of see it in some, of, not all perhaps, but in some of the masters. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, you know, where it's you see obvious. this kind of aplomb, you know, uh, way of, of playing where you know, look at Rubenstein or somebody and it's just like nothing. Yeah. And, um, and that was also, I felt when I was seeing these guys on, on film or hearing them on record, like that was the sound that I was going for yeah. that I loved. Um, it was a certain tone that I appreciated and uh, um, a sensitivity to to the keyboard that that just resonated, a way of touching the keyboard that resonated with me. Mm. Um, but I don't necessarily prescribe uh, or ascribe to saying, you know, that this is the only way to play the piano. It's just the way I learned. And But is it something that you have to, to remind yourself of at times? It is, yeah. It's a constant. I mean, yeah, you know, you get into situations where you're, nervous or there's tension or it's an uncomfortable situation but the piano is maybe the piano's not good or the sound is not good and you start tensing up and yeah um so what do you do i mean a lot of it's just relax you know you just kind of remember to relax and for me that might that just looks like you know trusting that you know i don't have to uh burn myself out at the keyboard in order to get this thing across. You know, it's, it can happen when you're trying to be, you know, super expressive that the tendency might be to tense up the hand. And I remember my teacher saying, you know, we're sort of illusionists. Yeah. Uh, you know, as musicians, if you're skilled, where you're creating this emotional content, this boiling up of emotion, and uh, you're, you, you have intensity without being tense. Yeah. You know, so you're kind of, You know, the audience might be in the grips, <laughs> mm. hopefully, of, of, you know, the emotional content, but that you're, you know, cool as a cucumber or something in that way. Um, not, not easy to do, you know. I think with experience, you realize that you can let go a little bit and trust your body that you've trained it to do the, the things that it needs to do to bring out this, this feeling. And it's always a, it's never perfect. It's sure. Just, yeah. Oh, you're always aspiring for yeah. something, and it's a journey, you know. Yeah, yeah. You journey. just the main thing for me is just not getting in the way 
of yeah. the music um, because tension creates blocks in the body and then sort of energy flow. I think I saw um, Cortot, I think it was, Alfred mm -hmm. Cortot. I think there was film of him in an interview or, or maybe it was a written interview. I just remember him talking about this kind of thing, you know, where the energy has to flow through. So if I'm tight, you know, it, I feel, yeah, it's not the music's constrained in a certain way. I've been trained in the same way. So all the, everything that you've said oh, feels great. good to hear again, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you feel the same way. You have you've had a great teacher, and somebody who has instilled a lot of wisdom in you, and and great thoughts about how to produce the sound, and you can't get enough of somebody else saying the same thing. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> reading about Corto is saying the same thing. You feel reassured, like yeah, it's actually the right path for me. You know, it's mm -hmm. always very personal, but mm -hmm. so hearing you say, it, you know. I'm always looking for these little mind games that help me yeah. get into that space. You know, one of my, one of the nice uh, mind games my teacher instilled in me was um, <coughs> the karate guys when they want to break through wood or even stone mm -hmm. or something. They imagine that their hand is meters long. Mm. So if you imagine that and then try to lift your arm, you actually realize how, how, yeah. uh, how heavy your arm yeah. in real life is. Also when yeah. you're when your arm, you know, when your arm falls asleep, you yeah. are, you've rested on your arm, right. and then you try to lift it up, you see, wow, this is so heavy. Yeah. And what am I doing lifting it up all the time, you know, using mm. that natural weight? Yeah, and, and it going down. So using, harnessing that power to have it go down, not without control, you know, but, but not, not, not having to push. I mean, that's certainly not necessary. Yeah. You know, and I think that was the main thing that really I felt started freed up. Mm. Let's see, last time I saw you in Cologne, um, uh, you played, uh, I remember you, mm. and you played it in a kind of a 12-8 groove and went to E-flat for the last A section. You mean, um, I remember April? That's what I meant, I'm sorry. Okay. But that is something that is a very great example of what you <laughs> do, because uh, I always see you pick these great standards, but mm. when you play you, them... Th th it doesn't. It does never sound like you're just jamming a standard. <laughs> okay. You make them the, your own, and actually, that kind of that particular standard. I remember April. I always had a kind of a. I know it. I know how to play it. I love Bird's version of it, or you know, Sonny <laughs> Rollins' version. Mm -hmm. But I never found a personal connection to it. Right? Yeah. And I saw you do this on stage. You know, uh, oh. in, in the great way to just take that center and do a couple of little adjustments <laughs> so it finds um, a mm. new space I went home and was like wow what a great idea <laughs> <But it's, laughs> you know um, I wonder how you arrive at this kind of um, personalizing standards making few choices uh, is there um, uh, an inspiration for that S somebody you've seen doing that or um, how do you, or what are your thoughts on when you play standards? They always sound very, very fresh. Oh, thank you. I, you know, my, my models of that really were the guys you mentioned, I think. You, you know, Bird, Sonny Rollins, Miles Davis, these kind of guys. But I mean, that was the tradition. It was, it was sort of like, I think, I think the issue can be that we get kind of complacent it's easy to get complacent about this is the way this song goes you either like it or you don't yeah based on the per a performance bad or good you know but all those guys they had their special thing you know i think if one goes back to the song itself and sort of falls in love all over again with the song yeah it comes naturally rather than it being <clears throat> as it most often is and it's understandable and it's the way we all learn is by copying. But we're a little bit like that, um, you know, the photocopy that keeps getting copied. Right, yeah. So that after a while, it doesn't even resemble the first thing. Um, or just to, to better put it, it, it just degrades. You know, it's like yeah. it's the same thing but worse, you know, each time. So the idea is that we're not trying to just recycle or recopy some somebody else's performance of that, but of course we're going to have it in our minds, you know, like 
it's hard not to think about Miles Davis when you think uh, Green Dolphin Street, right? I mean, unless you haven't gone back even that far, if not to the to earlier versions, right? Right. Where you might even have heard a, a society band playing it with the original chords. Yeah. You know, find out that that was actually a great chord. You know. Mm. Like Stella by Starlight, starting on the. G diminished. minor six rather than the, the E half diminished. You know? G minor six, you mean? Oh, okay. I, yeah. just, I, knew, I knew the other version with, you know, D, D flat diminished. But G minor six, that's cool. I, I'll try that. Yeah, I think that's the original chord. But what I'm just saying is that if you kind of go back to the source or, the, or close to it, closer to it, I think, you know, it doesn't mean that a creative person can't take, you know, the version he heard, somebody more contemporary playing it and do something interesting with it. But we tend to, I think, I mean, I, I tend tend to resonate with things, I guess, that I came up with, right? And that was just happened to be those those guys that you mentioned. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about your your ways to reharmonize a standard? I mean, there are plenty, of course, but yeah. I'm sure you have a concept behind, uh, you know, you have a knowledge of the chords and then you decide how you maybe change them in the way you feel them in the moment well i see harmony is is very uh kind of horizontal right so the idea that you have scales that are connecting one with another rather than vertically stacked chords mm -hmm. um so that there's more um of a sense of flow and movement between the, the voices and uh and that the harmony It doesn't necessarily have to have a top and a, a bottom and a top, you know what I mean? In that vertical way, it's more circular where you could, you know, like the circle of fifths or something like where you can just pick one <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or the scale itself looks better. Put, you put that in a circle, right? And you, you pick um, almost like all the harmony becomes modal, even if it's not an official mode, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that bass movement and all that kind of thing is, is much more fluid and can flow from right to left. That's just the way I think about it harmony in general so i think maybe the arrangements just come out of that of course there's other things that i'm doing or that i work out or think oh well this relates well generally the way i i like to do it is that for instance um even even stella by starlight which you're talking about as i understand it the i think believe the original chord is g minor six on that song so so somebody said well it's going to a so why don't we just go to five Right. Instead of, you know, six. <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the point being that, you know, what if it was C7 or what if, what if it was B flat major or what if it was D uh, natural minor or something, you know, like exploring the different points along the scale. Yeah. So a lot of that. My starting point is generally this, the, the original harmony. I like to dig in more to the original harmony to come up with reharmonization rather than random chords. Yeah. They can come up, but it generally is a it's generally a process for me of coming from of the one, original. Yeah, once removed and then the second cousin of that and then this yeah, yeah. that relates. And so a lot of times you can find the original chords just buried in whatever I'm doing, you know? And I think for me it creates a sense of um connection it, it keeps it yeah. maintains the connection to the original song even though it sounds like i'm out in left field yeah you would say but, that's the case also with um with your arrangement of nothing like you or something like that okay could be yeah i mean that's going pretty nuts that one <laughs> no it's just thinking of that is that the case maybe there too or well there's probably relative minors thrown in there i don't i don't remember I mean, it took me a while to piece that one back together without looking at it but because yeah. there's a lot of there's a, a lot, lot of stuff bass, happening there. a lot of bass movement yeah <laughs> but yeah get generally i mean i think that you know it's kind of like the tree you know you're <clears throat> you have the roots in the tree and then the branches can go further right yeah you know the further they go down so maybe it's like that at least that's that's the ideal or yeah. the idea you know bring back someone like sonny rollins you know His time was so solid, his harmony was so solid that he could he could stretch, and yet you felt still like he was on the ground. You know what I mean? Right. As opposed to it being like you know when we were first learning how to do this, even just playing more in a more traditional manner, 
trying to go outside, <laughs> mm. and yet we haven't fully defined what the yeah. boundaries are of inside. So we're kind of wandering around in the woods, you know, without mm-hmm. really any sense of where we are. And um, so that's the challenge, I think, of the improviser and, and by extension, you know, doing arrangements or composing. When you worked with Sonny, was he encouraging something like yeah. this, you know, like uh, also reharmonizing standards? Would well, he encourage that? Uh, I, thought, I mean, he never really said anything to me except one time there was a song of his. It was, I think it might have been a blues or a variation of a blues. He said to me, uh, we were backstage and, you know, he's got that, that voice. He's like, okay, Kevin, you know. <laughs> He said, uh, you know, we're going to play that one first, you know, you take the first solo, you know, play abstract. Mm. <laughs> so that was what I enjoyed doing. Anyway, I guess, you know, <laughs> he, he maybe heard me getting into that, you know, and he was my hero for that kind of thing. Yeah. Anyway, like how far he could stretch stuff. So I love to do that. So I was like, great, thanks <laughs> <laughs> for kind of permission granted, you know? Yeah. Perfect. In case there was any mystery. So, yeah, I think, um, I mean, just being around him was encouraging. Yeah. You know? Did you keep any recordings of, of that? I don't think I have any. I mean, there was like some bootlegs floating around. And... Mm. So when you think of him now, or your time with him, what comes to mind first? What I felt like he was doing was like, he was leaning into the music. It was just a constant commitment and leaning into the music there was never a sense that he was gonna there was even such a thing as wasting a note you know mm. and um i think that that <clears throat> that got in there for me as a quality that he had and i mean of course i had observed it in others but i think with him it was like i realized it on a deeper level that that i didn't want to waste notes and i always knew i didn't want to Because if I heard it back on a recording or I just heard myself playing it and I, I thought, well, I didn't really feel that. I was moving my hands, but I wasn't yeah. physically, you know, rhythmically in touch with that or melodically con you know, connected to that, like to the voice. Mm. As you would, you know, you would never think of singing a note <laughs> as, a, as a professional singer that you didn't, it would be impossible to imagine it. Mm -hmm. that's the whole thing but all of a sudden we get on these other instruments and we think we can just move our hands yeah yeah and it's have the same effect as you know a serious singer who is giving her all yeah. to the song or whatever melody it is improvised or not and and, and Son, sunny it's a great example sunny would play a melody over and over again and yet you know, these little shifts right going on and and so he was so steeped in that stuff in fact when i first worked with him He sent me a cassette tape of all the songs that we were going to play, and every one of them was singers of different eras singing these songs. Like, I want you to know how these really go. Hmm. You know, and I was like, wow, oh, man. Wow. You know, he wasn't sending me tapes of the band. He was sending me Ethel Waters and Billie Holiday. You know? Beautiful. Yeah, it was great. Great lesson. Cool. Uh, I'm always very amazed in uh, by your variety in rhythm when you play solos when you play lines mm. and I was wondering where you how you arrived at this uh, is that something that you do you know or you have been working on consciously or is it just the way yeah. you play or the guys you've listened to uh, it sort of developed over time but I I got kind of tired of playing eighth notes all the time yeah and um, you know I also have a love for singers and their phrasing and the freedom and of course all the horn players are trying to imitate the singers And all the piano players trying to play, imitate the horn players trying to imitate the singers. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, it's just natural. It's 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 it, it's um the rhythm of speech is so varied. Drummers. I mean, I always felt. I, I mean, I actually played drums when I was coming up. So yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that explains it. <laughs> so rhythm is always is, is is so important to me. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why why should I have to just play that all the eighth notes all the time? Yeah. Um, so I've just tried to find a way to make it flow and keep the, the feeling going, that swing thing or whatever it may be, while kind of, you know, riding, quote unquote, over, over top of the, of the pulse, 
Mm. Um, and again, going back to someone like Sonny or Herbie or Freddie Hubbard, Bobby Hutcherson, yeah. you know, how can they play all these notes that don't seem like they're in the pocket and yet the pocket never disappears? Yeah. You know, and that's what I always aspired to, to, to have that kind of freedom and yet being, you know, again, being grounded. Beautiful. I was wondering, um, you know, my, my favorite record, if I would have to pick one of your records, and I love them all, of course, uh, is, uh, is this one. Oh, know, wow. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could maybe uh, tell me a couple of stories about that record and uh, uh -huh. where you were, you know, where you were uh, in your mind um, during that time, what, what interests you and also what uh, made you pick those guys, Every, everything that comes to mind. Uh, I, I'd be very uh, it, happy if you share a little bit. Oh, well, that was a long time ago. I had done two records for Blue Note at that point, and uh, they were going for a third for some reason. And, uh, um, you know, of course, those two guys are my heroes, Ron and Jack. Well, to tell you the truth, I actually called Roy Haynes first for that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that was the plan. But he, <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, a long time ago, and I, I, I had been playing with him a little bit. So I thought, oh, let me see if he would do it, you know. And he said, oh, I'm in retirement. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, or trying to retire or whatever. So that wasn't, of course, to be. But um, so then, then I just thought, well, man, I bet Ron and Jack would be great, mm -hmm. you know. And uh turned out it was. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really even think they had done a ton of playing together, you know? I mean, they kind of missed each other in Miles' band. I think um, they were on a lot of the CDI records. He, okay, so maybe there was that, yeah. And the, the Joe Henderson, the Power to that's, the People. That's true, Power to the People. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much live playing they had done. but Yeah, uh, sure. And we recorded it. I got my friend Bob Belden to produce it and James Farber to engineer it. And we recorded it at Clinton Studios in New York. Um, that studio's gone, unfortunately. Clinton was a big room. And actually, that piano, the sound of it might ring a bell. As far as I understand, and it, when I listen to it, it makes sense. I think that's the Columbia piano. That was the Columbia piano. Oh, okay. You mm -hmm. know, the, all the Miles stuff, you know, and like... Glenn Gould. I, I think... Well, I don't know if he played that particular piano, perhaps. That's what I read somewhere, but maybe... Oh, well, I'll have to listen. So the same piano was... Yeah. Like, kind of blue and... Uh, yeah. Man. So it may have been... I think it was that piano, because I could hear the sound of it, and um, it made sense. Wow. So pretty crazy. Yeah, it was like, you know, it was an obviously an older instrument, and... Maybe it wasn't the best maintained, but it was it was good. And James, of course, got a great sound on it. We kind of and we also that was recorded analog, so it was a little bit of a throwback in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel you know I feel good about. it. I feel like I was sort of st still in development uh, stages in terms of my influences um, were pretty. I think pretty evident. You know, I certainly you hear the Herbie. I think yeah influence on on my playing and but you know i was getting at something i think and uh and it was it was amazing playing with those guys and you know power powerhouse rhythm team you know mm -hmm. um i just have memories of memories of of ron and jack talking about different bass players talking about percy heath and mm -hmm. sort of like them catching up and uh me being a fly in the wall listening to them reminisce about stuff and uh did you send your tunes in advance or the, were they just uh, rehearsing I gave them, them for to the ron, session you know ron was the week like a couple weeks or something like that before the session ron was playing with tony williams um at uh birdland in new york and uh i think it was mulgrew actually i think it was, they were playing trio if i recall so i went by the club to give Ron the music. Yeah, so he, he had a chance to check it out, and I don't remember back then if I, I don't think I gave him anything to listen to. It wasn't like the days where you yeah. just bring everything around as much. 
I remember he uh, he liked the bass line that I, I wrote for him, which, you know, it's kind of like a Ron-ish line anyway, but uh, on Agua, this yeah, opening, the opening track. And he was like, yeah, Kevin, I like that bass line. <laughs> mm. Although he called me Kelvin. He used to mess around with me and call me Kelvin. <laughs> and I had played a few times. I'd never played with Jack, but I'd played a few times with Ron. With um, Benny Golson would hire him occasionally, and he would, you know, so I'd show up on the gig, and there would be Ron. Wow. So um, it'd be pretty cool. Um, and maybe one other thing with like Lenny White. So we were somewhat acquaint acquainted with each other. And uh, so when you play with somebody like Ron, do you go and ask him about you know exchanging chords and all that stuff? Would you kind of try to get some like substitutions and stuff? Yeah. We, no, no, I mean, usually it was just, he would do something funny and then he would wink at me, you know, mm. uh, it wasn't, <laughs> nothing was really talked about plan wise. I mean, I mean, in terms of, I, I'm thinking more about when we've played live, but in terms of the session, you know, we did talk about a couple things. He had a suggestion. I had planned to, um, you know, we, we recorded that Beatles song and I love her and I had just thought, okay, I'll play on the changes that I wrote. You know, I re kind of reharmonized it. But then he had the idea of just going up a half step and just staying in that one key. So we was in G flat minor. And yeah. then when we went to solo, he said, hey, why don't we go up a half step and just blow on that? So that was, that was, that came from Ron, that idea, just to He wanted to play some open strings, maybe. Perhaps in G, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, G flat one might not have been the most fun. But, uh... No, but it sounds great that uh, that uh, shift. It really yeah. lifts, lifts the song. It, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And, and then just sort of, it almost felt like, I don't think we planned it, but almost like Jack, we were kind of trading in a way, or my phrases were trading with Jack. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like how that came out. Yeah, you were, you were one of my, my idols who played that song. You know, there's the great version of Shirley Horn playing that song. Oh, I don't know her version. I got to listen to that. Oh man, it's from the '60s. Mm. Uh, from that record uh, called um, "Traveling Light." Oh, okay. And she that. she plays she plays piano and she sings. Mm. And it's it's uh, beautiful. And then oh, the, as you, and then there's Fred Hirsch also has a nice mm -hmm. version of that song. So I, I love all of those versions. But it's cool oh. how everyone treats it differently. Yeah. And still that you know that great composition shines no matter how you. Great song. What yeah. you what you do with it. Mm. But now that you said, you know, uh, you you first wanted to have Roy on the record, that that is a cool thought for me to, you know, <laughs> imagine what that would sound like. Because I have a bootleg of you playing with Roy. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, and it sounds amazing, you guys. I actually wanted to, uh, to, to ask you a little bit about that, how it felt, you know, playing with Roy and what kind of challenges that brought to you as a as a accompanist and yeah. piano player. Yeah, he was, uh, he's powerhouse man i mean it was i was pretty nervous doing that gig at the beginning and i was like he just so much energy coming from that guy i mean mainly it's just trying to get in there you know with the with his his um sense of time and uh yeah a lot of rhythm going on there mm -hmm. yeah the bootleg i have from you guys you play uh, trinkle tinkle oh wow fee fi fo fum Mm. and summer night and mirror mirror and stuff mm. like that would he just call out these tunes or uh, would he expect you to know all of these tunes or would he... yeah no he had a basic book i don't think he necessarily made set lists i think he, he liked to call things mm. uh on the bandstand as i recall who who was playing saxophone donald harrison or i'm not sure about the saxophone mm. because i don't have any info on that was it alto or tenor do you know it was tenor. <clears throat> probably don Braden. yeah It makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to oh, you. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear it. It's been years since. Sounds then. great, I, man. I snuck in my recorder to a few gigs. I probably have some DAT tapes or cassette mm -hmm. tapes or something around in my collection. But my friend Ed Howard and Dave Kokoski, who played with him for years, kind of recommended me for that gig because I was playing with Ed, with Eddie Henderson a little bit. And then I, you know, I'd met Dave on the scene mm. and he recommended me yeah. but yeah it was really exciting i loved playing with roy it was just uh for how long did that go on i did gigs on and off for maybe i don't know a couple of years mm. you know he would call me for stuff and uh 
yeah, it was really exciting to, to play with him. Mm -hmm. You had a <clears throat> kind of a, in the beginning of the 90s, you had kind of a, you know, very high output of, of stuff. And then you did this record, the Under Lucia record. And then there's a couple of years gap in your discography until you do the, um, this record, What Survives. Oh. So I was wondering what happened between those records. Uh, what, what did you do? I mean, you were pretty active as a sideman during that time. Yeah. But I was wondering what uh, made you not do another record in the kind of time span that you had put out records yeah. before. It's a good question. That specific uh, period that would have been like five, six years or something like that, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was a kind of regrouping period for me. I wasn't quite sure maybe where I was at creatively. Yeah, I think it was in a way a, a incubation period in, for, in ways for me, both artistically and personally. Mm -hmm. My um, personality can lean towards the ruminative, meaning, you know, getting caught up in one's thoughts. And, you know, there was a period of time where I was kind of depressed and just not feeling you know, very happy and, and not kind of without a, without a real direction. And so I was doing, yeah, I was doing sideman gigs and, but I didn't like set out to say I wasn't going to record. I just, if someone had offered me a record date, I probably would have done it. You know, mm -hmm, but, I see. But I'm, I'm wondering about that because these kind of periods, I think we all have um, in different, you know, in different ages or in different, also in different time spans. You know, mm. somebody stays in that zone a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. Yeah. Usually these feelings that we have, like, I, I can't play. Usually with me, I, these feelings of not being satisfied with how I play, which is, you know, uh, pretty often, uh, that usually is when I'm about to make a next step. Like Yeah, that can be. I yeah. hit a wall and then you kind of climb that wall and, yeah. you know. And, but 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 once you you get to that wall, you you think there's no way back and there's no way forward. Also, right. and you right. kind of you're stuck and you feel like oh I can't play I can't play how I played a couple of years before. Right. Yeah, it was probably a combination of things for me. I kind of felt like I hit a wall in, in a sense with with my kind of young lion self. You know. You know. I coming coming up. I didn't even though I I had you know, these natural gifts for melody and rhythm and stuff like that. And I could pick things up easily. Um, I started to max out on that and I didn't feel like enough was coming from internally. It was all kind of like regurgitating or it felt like to me that I was regurgitating the music that I had heard and absorbed in a more derivative way. And I wasn't happy with that. You know, I didn't want to be little Herbie Hancock, you know, uh, or whatever. And, uh, so I think part of it was that just not, you know, not feeling, um, you know, like I, I was that I was following some internal or interior uh, dictate. You know what I mean? How did you get out of that zone? I have no idea, really. Uh, I think one of the things was that I, uh, I, I kind of stopped listening to jazz. Um, you know, maybe some of this stuff started happening you know, it's all a, on a kind of fluid continuum, but, but, um, you know, I just remember really trying to listen to what I was actually playing as opposed to what I thought it should sound like or what references I had from before. Yeah. And then I think things started, I started to get a grasp of something that was maybe more myself and following that thread to its, you know, to each conclusion. Mm. And I think that that helped me to say, well, you know, how do I hear playing music? How do I hear rhythm? How do I hear these lines? You know, you know, I'm, I'm bored just playing eighth notes. As we talked about before, I, I always loved horn players and singers where there was this constant play of phrasing. Mm. You know, it's kind of like this weird thing. It's almost closer to the thing with um, like the vibes or marimba where you know, we are playing a percussion instrument, so each time we hit something, it's it, it's very defined. You know, mm. 
one of the things that happened was, um, and this might have been even earlier in the process um, for me, was uh, getting a little marimba. I remember where I was out on the road with uh, um, Josh Redman in the early days. Brian Blade was in the band, and I think Christian was playing bass. And uh, this is before, you know, it was like his first record we did. I mean, again, this is going backwards a bit, but um, this is always in my mind. And I bought this little marimba in San Francisco. We went, Brian and I went to go hear Bobby Hutcherson and, uh, mm. and it was just great and kind of blew my mind. And, and the next day we went to a, a music store and I saw this like little pint size marimba, you know, like two octaves maybe. And, uh, and I bought it and put it in my suitcase or whatever and brought it home and mm. started playing with it. And, you know, I played a little drums when I was growing up, so I had some facility in the piano, but, you know, it's a different instrument. you got to cross all these weird ways for stuff. And because I couldn't really play the thing very well, I was missing notes and my rhythm was like it was kind of more open, you know. Mm like beginner's mind kind of thing. And all of a sudden I was like, man, I want to translate that to the piano because mm. I liked how I liked the space between the notes that I didn't have because I almost had too much facility, mm -hmm. too familiar with the piano. So it always seemed to be about slowing things down or most of the time it was about slowing things down from where I might play them as a sort of technician. Mm. I never really wanted to play anything just because I could play it um and i had a pretty good well, i had a very good uh classical like i kind of re overhauled my technique when i was in high school i think i might have mentioned that training yeah, you did. eleanor hancock so you know that made playing the piano easier and more fluid and you know i could grab things that i wasn't able to do before um you know not that i became any kind of virtuoso necessarily you know um but but things were easier and i, I could play better um but that always comes with a kind of liability that just because you can play something doesn't mean you should right. musically, the musical choice. And uh, I, I remember getting to the point where I would actively stop myself from doing something that I had that, that was predictable or that was easy for me to play or, or something that was a, uh, a pattern or a kind of arpeggio that I didn't feel musically connected to, yeah. you know. Or emotionally connected to so so in some ways the 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 phrasing thing that i kind of got into was from that Sl i had to slow things down in order to make them conscious to make more conscious choices mm. you know so that became a kind of thing where i realized i was having an opportunity to have the kind of phrasing and effect that maybe some of these great singers had or the horn players who were who, who had that kind of um, language aspect to their playing, you know, that it, that it was less, um, uh, less obvious, you know, mm. what they were doing rhythmically. Mm. That's interesting. What are your thoughts on, uh, do, you, do you practice hearing? I think just by practicing, I'm practicing hearing. I teach a little bit, and um, one of the things that I've noticed, or that I've said to students, that, I, that I've noticed is that, you know, there's this whole thing about don't play something you don't hear ahead of time. But for me, it's too restrictive a formula. You know, there's only 12 tones that we're dealing with here. If a note sounds funny, that's good news to me because of the, the note that sounds serious is just a half step away, right? Oh, man. Yeah. So there's no real wrong notes. Yeah. Um, so I don't sweat it so much. In fact, the way for me to push my ear is to play things I don't necessarily hear. Right. And, yeah. but, but, but it needs to be something that I feel I need to be connected to it. It's not like I'm, I can't hit a note that I'm hearing, you know, ahead of time. It's not to say that, but I think it's, it talks about, it speaks about the taking risks, you know, mm. and to continuously, for me, improvisation is all about taking risks and then seeing how you can, you're constantly sort of course correcting, you know, um, 
but it all becomes part of the fabric of, of let's say the line if it's a in a single line that you're playing right as a melodic line um, so to me it's all kind of a game you know where I'm I'm on that edge of what I know it's gonna sound like and not being not quite sure yeah but being open in the moment and then that's to me that's like the crest of the wave that y you know you're looking for yeah. to be right there in that moment um, r riding that thing because it's not so much that I'm leading it I'm almost it's a it's like a play between leading and following mm. following the music following where it wants to go or we want to go as like two dancers or something mm. um so it's a it's a relationship it's it's not like on a good night mm. i'm not imposing my ideas on the music you know mm. i'm there to to interact with it as like a living almost like a living thing so i challenge that belief you know that we say oh don't play anything unless you hear it i mean I would go more for feeling and not worrying so much about the actual notes. They don't matter as much mm -hmm. because those can always be, those are always being altered. They're always shifting around and moving to the right or the left, you know, in the case mm -hmm. of the piano. You've mentioned uh, Herbie as a big influence on you a couple of times already. And he's kind of my guy too. Uh, you know, I've, I did so much uh, research on him, uh, you know, aside from having every one of his records leader and, you know, most of the Sideman stuff, bootlegs and everything. I spent so much time on trying to check out everybody that he checked out. So mm. re reading so many interviews and, you know, all these sources mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, information about him. Yeah. I was what, actually wondering what, what you did. Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same. I listened to his records with stuff with Miles, the Blue Note records. Just the way he put together his own influences. Um, I had a chance to hang out with him once in Japan. He talked about being a kind of link in the chain and what a, an honor it was to to be part of that, of this tradition. And he mentioned Bill Evans and, and Wynton Kelly. And he said, you know, no Bill Evans, no Wynton Kelly, no, no Herbie Hancock. Mm. You know, and, um, you know, perhaps it was also, you know, no Claire Fisher, no Gil Ravel. Evans. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 uh, some of the classical stuff that he was listening to. So, mm. you know, we're all putting this together in our own way. And I was really kind of at my, this point where I was, I was so into him that I, you know, I had put him on, on such a pedestal musically that it was hard to, like I was saying, uh, hard to kind of see what I was about, even though I had other interests. I mean, there were other artists. I mean, there were, it, he wasn't the only guy, but it was, he, it was like he, he synthesized the stuff in a way that was, that it was obviously, you know, deep, made a deep impression. Yeah. And, uh, it was like everything I wanted to do. It seemed like he did it best, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> in a way best in my mind. Yeah. You know? But I remember kind of talking to him about it, you know, like I was having a real problem with him, you know, <laughs> like I got a problem with you, Herbie, you know, like you don't realize the influence you've had on all of us and how challenging it is to, I think particularly even at that time, you know, jazz had gone through sort of all these different changes and like, you know, where were we to find a direction or something like that? You know, he had heard me play some music with Pat Zimmerly, who was very, at that time, very forward-thinking composer and uh, was writing highly polyrhythmic music, very difficult, layered music. And he heard us doing that with on the Monk competition uh, for, for composition that Pat had entered with the band that we were in. It was me and Larry Grenadier at the time and uh, Tom Rainey. There's a record just released. Oh, yes, he put yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah. Conceptualysis. Yeah, you know, like it's cool. Real heady shit. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the stuff was pretty, pretty open. And, you know, it gave me a chance to explore some things that were maybe a little bit different, you know. 
working with, especially like working that stuff out with Pat helped help me. I think in my quest for a freer way of phrasing, I didn't really become somebody who was very. I mean, math is always in there, but not super mathematical. You know, like I'm not demanding fives over sevens from myself most yeah. of the time. You know what I mean? But it was a sound that I identified with, and it felt right. You know, to try that stuff. So. So he had heard me do that, you know, and I was just like really beside myself. I was like, well, what do I do, man? You know, like, <laughs> I can't, I just, I don't know, I got nothing, you know, <laughs> and uh, I got nothing new. And uh, and he said, man, you know, I, I heard you play that thing and you should go for that. You know, like that's, you play your ass off, just do your thing, you know, and that helped me to hear that. Um, wow. Uh, from someone like that, who I had so much respect and love for. Um, I was actually asking that because I'm getting at something. I, I um, heard this great interview with an actor. Can't remember his full name right now. His first name is Michael and he plays in all these Christopher Guest movies. Oh. You know the My Christopher Guest movies that are m mostly yeah, improvised? They're, yeah, they're great. Um, yeah. So there's Mike? this one guy, he played a, he played a, a gay a guy in this in this dog competition um yeah best movie. in show yeah best in show great movie yeah and he he was an actor who at some point he he was hired to do a movie uh, about david letterman he played david letterman really so and that was kind of at the um i think letterman was always at a, at a peak but that was an, one of his peaks Mm. He was really, really uh, famous. The 80s, uh, you something. Know. Yeah, I think it was 90s. maybe mid mid nineties or something. Okay. So he was doing a TV movie playing David Letterman, mm. and he talked about the difficulty of playing him and thinking about the audience who could do just with <laughs> one hit on the switch, yeah. could see the real thing and could then right. could see him. <laughs> and he said a, a very interesting thing, uh, which I think a lot about. And he said, "Don't imitate." Because the audience will only focus on the differences. Yeah. Stop chasing everyone's picture of the guy you are trying to get at. Mm. Uh, present your own view of, mm. of that guy. That's cool. And that's so cool because if you want to present an own view of somebody, you have to get the full picture. You have to see 100%. You have mm -hmm. to see him. Not just like everyone else's view of somebody else. Yeah. It's usually just the top that everybody copies, you know, yes. the, the obvious right. stuff, you right. know, but um, that everybody imitates also. Right. But yes. if you want to, if you want to present your view and then get a, mm -hmm. get a personal experience out of that for you and also for the audience, you have to go deep. Yeah. And this is what I think you did with Herbie. Perhaps so. Uh, and this is why yeah. you never sounded to me, um, like somebody who's imitating Herbie mm. and actually you've helped me a lot to um, learn some things about Herbie that I couldn't <laughs> learn from himself I don't, it's hard to <laughs> I, it's hard to put into words but mm. your view on Herbie helped me analyze stuff from Herbie that were wow. harder for me to analyze coming from Herbie himself Wow. Uh, and also I, yeah I always had that feeling that you have you had a very, very personal view on him, and that lifted you up to do mm. your own thing. And well, especially, you know, and especially, yeah. sorry, especially that time between Andalusia and, you know, the time between those that we talked about. Mm. I think a lot of stuff happened between that time. You did so many exciting stuff as uh, sidemen that I really love, and where I can see also that there is a change in your playing also. Mm -hmm. But before that, also, it that never sounded to me like it always sounded to me like you love Herbie. Mm. But also, you love so many other people. Yeah. And you're not trying to chase, right? You know, everyone's image of that guy. Yeah. Well, there's certain you know like obvious sort of lick stuff, and that 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 stuff goes against my grain anyway. So to do that, so yeah, I guess in a way, like his approach, I think you could say the spirit of it you know, was what I, I think was so moving to me anyway. It was like an, an approach that is open in a way 
that resonated with me. So, you know, you're talking about kind of a uni universal values or something as a creative person, if that makes any sense, you know, like yeah. openness and honesty and, you know, like confidence without being like a complete egomaniac or something. Mm -hmm. Like you could, you could hear the kind of curiosity, you know, in his playing. You know, as a, as, as a, as a creative being, we all, you know, we're trying to sort of just be in integrity, I think, and honest. And there's all kinds of hindrances to that in the world, wanting to be accepted, playing or saying the expected thing, toting the party line, you know, whatever your, whatever the party is. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Not, not taking the kinds of personal risks uh, to be unique, you know, peer pressure, all this kind of thing. Yeah. Throughout, I always, even if there were, were those tendencies, just continually something within me bucking against that so that when I sit down at the piano, something true, hopefully, of myself comes out, no matter what it is that I'm playing. And, yeah. um, you know, and uh, that, that's, that's, that's definitely, that's been there, I, I, I think, from the beginning, but it gets obscured when you... You know, you're so like, oh, look at the bright lights, you know. <laughs> Everybody's saying, oh, man, you sound great. Well, you better keep doing that, what you're doing then, you know, because then if you change, then what, you know. So, right, like personal security stuff going on, you know, around or insecurity where you're just really trying to trying to find your find your way through uh, through this jungle of opinion. Hmm including your own that you've adopted and you know you're just trying to sort this shit out so in that sense i'm probably a bit of a late bloomer <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and i think i feel i hope that it's still going on you know and sort of in a way still searching for that but i'm more i'm more comfortable with yeah i'm more comfortable with just letting that process happen because that's life yeah we are we are in process. The main thing for me, psychologically and spiritually, is just to get out of my own way, to get out of one's own way, so that you yeah. can hear what's actually going on inside, and then to to faithfully represent that with what you're doing. Yeah, I think we're all struggling with that. Yeah, it's it's... the un universal struggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, those those that are that are inclined that way. After a while, it just we can almost reduce the notes and the pitches, and just becomes psychology <laughs> and <laughs> human interaction. Right? Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff going on. We don't, we're still discovering. I just I didn't want to hear any more Miles bootlegs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I also feel like I was I was pretty I you know I'm a pretty intense guy, and I you know and I I accept or reject things. I I. I Back then, in particular, I mean, I've loosened up a lot, you know, but it was like, no more Herbie, you know, like, okay. cut him off, you know, cut him. So you can't really do that. And why would you want? It's like, you know, there's all these wonderful things that you get, you know, but I was feeling like a crisis was upon me, you know, that mm. that that uh, I, I had lost any, you know, sense of of myself because I had gone so deeply into one particular artist. Um, that was my perception, which was probably off. It's like, you know, Ellie DeGebre, who actually played with Herbie uh, for a bit. I remember being in a workshop with him and he, he said, you know, like, man, no matter how much you try, sound like someone, you're still going to sound like yourself. Yeah. You may sound like shit, you know, <laughs> But don't worry about it. You're not going to sound. You're not going to sound like exactly like him anyway. You know. Yeah. What I mean? um, but I, ne I, you know, when I heard people who were so obviously imitating, right? Like they were just everything they were doing, just just try to cop somebody's thing. Whenever they would have their own moment, it sounded so like you were saying. You only hear the differences, right? Yeah. The actor. It's like you, you're like, well, you know. You should have stayed with that solo you were playing of his or something or that lick. But so, um, you know, when it, when someone would go off and you could kind of tell like they 
they had this mask on and all of a sudden it slipped off for a second and then mm. whoops that's not because they hadn't developed yeah they hadn't developed the understanding of what was underneath what they were doing i mean i've heard guys imitate joe henderson and playing his licks in the wrong key like i mean clearly not understanding what was going on harmonically yeah you know just because like well i got this lick i can cut and paste it and go you know around in different things. yeah i was going to mention one guy um you know when i first heard mark turner back in the day when we were both developing you know he sounded kind of spitting image of joe henderson mm. you know and I had heard him before that, you know, like he went through these development periods where he like really absorbed Coltrane and his cat digested them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, maybe what we're talking about. It's in a way a, a good example of, you know, somebody who found his way, you know, like what, what, what resonates with me? And, and now he, you know, he's Mark Turner. He was always Mark Turner, you know, sure. and, and probably back then, like if I were to hear him now, I'd be like, "Oh, that's Mark Turner." Yeah. You know, I wouldn't hear necessarily Joe Henderson. So it's always there, but you know, and everybody, everybody does this stuff at a different rate. I think at a different time. I mean, some people seem to just be spit out of the <laughs> the womb. Mm. You know, sounding like the, like you know, I think it's a little rare, but you know, many have a very strong personality and. Uh, um, musically and, and the way that they hear things and stuff like that. But Who would you say one of your peers is like that? Well, like Bill Stewart, you know, when you hear Bill, I mean, you can hear the influences, but you hear, it's a very, for me, it's a very strong voice, you know. Yeah. Someone totally. like that, yeah. Um, I think Brad also mm. uh, early on had characteristics that were unmistakable, you know. Um you know, and who knows, maybe there were things that well, I was doing that, you know. Um, yeah, the, as, I, as I, said, yeah. I said it before, you know, to me, so, you always sounded like yourself. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, it can, can be kind of an exercise in ego mania um, to worry about all these things. <laughs> With all the shit that's going on in the world, it's like, oh, how do I sound tonight? You know? <laughs> And do I sound like myself? It's a little narcissistic. Yeah. But um, but hey, you know, artists. It's what, what we do. do? <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah. Um, hopefully it's for a good cause. It goes to a good cause. Yeah. But um, I remember uh, there's a, I think it's a quote from Stravinsky that the good composers borrow, great composers steal. Steel. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Don't really worry about it too much. It's another quote I actually thought a lot about because if you borrow something, it's not really yours. And if you steal it, although it's, you know, illegal, <laughs> if you steal it, it's yours, you know? And if it's something that's yours, you use it. That's use probably it. why, yeah, you it's know. probably what he meant. Yeah, of course. Of course, you can't really steal anything. I mean, you can, yeah, there's copyright infringement, you know, mm. but I don't think, yeah, we know what he meant. You know, yeah. right? It's like appropriate and in the way that the artists do. In fact, there's a great book called Steal Like an Artist. Oh. It's a great little art book. Um, and I try to the guy's name is uh, Austin something. Austin Powers. Very wise guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shagalicious. <laughs> so, yeah, he uh, it's a really great book. Um, I recommend it on, you know, creativity and just the reality. You know, basically he's saying, if you think someone's a total original, you just don't understand, you don't know their, what yeah. they're referring, you don't know what they're referring to. Right. You know, um, some people have a stronger kind of, or sort of saying something particularly unique, you know, but still you're kind of missing the, You, you just don't, you know, you don't know their, their influences as much. Yeah, know? it's true. Chances are, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the beautiful thing, too, is that everybody, you know, we, we're all unique and we have our little twist on things. So. Mm -hmm.